this clown has an awful lot to answer for. Um, you know, essentially, that is what I've always wanted to be when I grow up, and um, probably still is in truth. But since I started in this wildly irresponsible way of making a living, it's gone from being this sort of rather wonderful, intellectually free, fun um, activity that was all about adventure and swag and was very much trousers optional and has um, developed into something which is rather more professional in which um, the trousers often have to be fireproof to remind the situation in which you find yourself. Um, but the things that we used to enjoy in archaeology are still there and I think what we've got to do with this future proofing of the profession is to make sure that we don't lose that passion and enjoyment of the past. And um, although the think that the structures that were in place such as they were then were very free, it has enabled us all to develop a quite disparate um, career, however um, half assed that may have been. And um, the thing that I've particularly noticed of recent years is working with other colleagues in the um, construction industry. That first of all, we've all had the conversation where they're absolutely staggered that we get out of bed in the morning for that. Um, but as you talk about the way in which you become an archaeologist and, and how you're actually allowed to wield the power that we apparently do, um, they're all equally staggered by the fact that we have to learn very little once we've got in it. We go to university and then you get a job and that's it, really. You know, we have to do all the CSCS stuff and we can add skills to what we do, but it's by no means in any generally structured way. And I've got a very crude um, diagram of the usual people that we wish we got paid the same as, um, and how long it takes them to become chartered individually, and what they're required to do to do that. And the periods of time can be quite long. Those are very, this thing is very approximate. So anybody who's actually a member of one of these chartered institutes, please don't take it personally. I just knock this together for the purposes of, of scale, really. It will take at least that long to become chartered in those particular fields. And there are a number of stages that you have to go through. And there are all elements of theory and practice, the, um, the academic and the vocational training. But what seems to me to particularly define their chartership and their professionalism is the fact that at some point after graduation, you also have to go through a, pro a process of professional assessment which is considerably more rigorous than joining CIFA, for example. And I'm not sure about, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure about CIFA. It sounds like you might need some ointment after you've gone <laughs> um, And uh, I think it's very, is key in the way that we understand what chartership means. Because I think the reason why you have to have chartered people in any profession is so that you can demonstrate to your clients that you have a level of expertise which enables you to identify yourself with the profession as opposed to just being yourself muddling along. And if you don't have that level of professional assessment within becoming chartered, then it's very difficult to actually demonstrate your skill. And you, the things that we do, the, the joining structure as it stands at the moment, you do have to produce a body of work, but you don't have a, a proof of that quality in the same way as you would do um, having a viva after a PhD, for example, which I think is analogous. And the other thing that they all have, which we currently kind of do, again, in a fairly half assed amateurish sort of way, is alternative routes in. And um, if we just look at architects in a little bit more detail, what they have to do is structured. You have to, um, you go, you do your undergraduate degree, 
then you have to work, and that has to be graded, and then you go on and do more study, which is again graded, and then eventually, if you've still got breath in your body, you can then register with the, Ar the Architects Registration Board and apply for chartership. It's a long process and it's extremely rigorous. And I've only produced the architect list because otherwise we'd be here for far too long and we'd all um, die of boredom. But um, the key things about all of these professions is that they have a training which is both academic and vocational so that there is already an understanding of the dif difference between knowledge and skills, which I don't think that we necessarily always follow through. There's, the knowledge is very much up there, but the skills, not, not, not so much, I don't think. They're not di directly taught in most universities, and certainly once you get out of university, you're lucky to receive any proper teaching at all. Um, and the professional assessment element, subsequent to your undergraduate career and then your professional life, is possible to fail. It's not just an easy, time-served kind of ticket. You can fail to pass your professional assessment and go and do it again and again until you do, but it's still possible. It's, a, it's very, very important. It's a milestone. And most of, well, I don't know about anybody else, but that milestone is a long way back in my wake now. And it's, if we, the milestones that we have in our future careers are ones that we're going to create for ourselves. And they are things that we want to do. They're not necessarily put there by our institute. Um, <coughs> the alternative entry routes thing is something that I'm going to bang on about quite a lot more later on. Um, but again, it's vital because these organisations all recognise that there are a huge number of different possibilities to arrive at being skilled. It's not necessary just to go to university and learn about everything about Roman pottery and then go and do just that for the rest of your life. You can come in at any point along the spine of a profession if you've got the right sort of time served behind you. So if I nip along to this, I think, I don't know if any of you have looked at this, but I think this is a brilliant example of how to help people structure their own careers. Basically, it's everything that you could possibly do within the construction industry. And you can start at any point with a search by career by what you're doing at the moment, and it will give you a roadmap to the things that you could do next. And to return to the architecture one, I picked architectural technician because most of our, the, the technician grade, the digger grade, um, is where people tend to start in the bit of archaeology that I work in. And it shows you that there are progression opportunities to architectural technologists, which would be the next sensible step, um, which is chartered. But it also gives you these other routes. And you can see that in the construction industry, which essentially, a lot of the time, I suspect a lot of us really work with and in has a very flexible skills route and the great thing about archaeology and I never tire of telling this to anybody who is a history teacher for example is that archaeology is everything you know there it's the perfect fourth A level because you can add it to any science technology language arts set of um, A-levels and you can add to it because it gives you a perspective from the past. And the same thing applies to any of the other jobs in the construction industry because because archaeology is everything, we've got something to say about the basis of any other um, part of any other profession. And that, I think, is what excites people about archaeology when they get excited about it is that it said something to them so 
we should be able to develop a spectacularly flexible set of entry routes and progression routes. And that, I think, possibly more important than entry is progression, that people find out what they're interested in and can find a way to it. Now, um, Kate mentioned these. How many of you are aware of the national occupational standards in archaeological practice? That's not nearly enough. These. Stick with the script. <laughs> now, what these? They've been around for over a decade. They've just been recently um, uh, brought up to date, and they identify 60 individual skill sets, which themselves break down into a wide variety of behaviours and, um, and knowledge-based individual skills. And in total, I think the individual skills are over 3,000, which cover, theoretically, anything that any of you would ever want to or need to do. Um, and they're a massively important tool for developing whole life training. And they exist in all the other professions that we, that we deal with, and they guide the processes of designing things like NVQs and apprenticeships. Apprenticeships, I hope, are going to be the next big thing for us. And um, a chap called Bob Hooker, what's it called now, Historic England? <laughs> It'll be something else next week. But anyway, Bob Hook is leading the, um, the awfully named Trailblazers group for um, archaeological apprenticeships. And hopefully, within the next year, we're going to start seeing the first of those. And they will be based around the National Occupational Standards. And anything that you do in your individual um, organizations, which is about training, should reference these, because it will make life a hell of a lot easier for you in designing them. This is the wheel that you don't need to reinvent. And that's all of them. And don't try and read it, because you'll drive yourself, I can even read it from here. <laughs> but I just picked um, a sort of random bit from my uh, spreadsheet. These things, the acronyms, that's creative cultural skills, archaeological practice, and then there's a, a unit um, designation. And they identify skill sets, and I've also pinged in a appropriate level of either well, what was then the IFA membership and what the grade is at Wessex Archaeology, the NVQ level, heaven alone knows what no no yes is all about. And then um, you can actually, if one were wired, that would take you straight to the specification for that NVQ. And um, the one that I've chosen for that is this, the classify, compile and maintain data, blah, blah, blah. And if this works, we'll go to it. Oh, for heaven's sake. What do I have to do now, Doug? Press it again? Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sound convincing. Right, thank you very much. Oh, Go on, last year. What's nope. going on? So, no, press it one. one more time, the square one. The square one? Yep. And one more time. There we go. Try. Not pressing it again? Yeah. Yep. Nope. There's something um, more Guess terribly wrong. Quick. Go on. See, I think training and the use of PowerPoint is also extremely important <laughs> for the future. <laughs> okay. There you go. Ah, marvellous. You've gone too far now. No? By the way. Brilliant. There you go. Okay, now, this is essentially how the things are broken down. Um, once you get into the specification for that particular skill, these are performance criteria which have been worked out at um, great and almost exhausting length um, by people better than ourselves. And it means that we don't have to do it ourselves. At Wessex, we're, um, we're currently developing a bunch of um, training courses for um, technicians initially, but hopefully it will carry on to a more sort of 
overarching and strategic level, but essentially all of our specifications are written to these standards. So they're split up into um, performance and knowledge criteria, and they describe in fairly deep detail what you need to do to do that. <coughs> but you'll also notice that they're not absolutely precise um, relevant technical and ethical <coughs> standards, which mean almost anything if you don't already know. And the point of these sort of standards is, is that they're very loose, because you individually have to figure out how you're going to do that and how you're going to demonstrate that you do it. So these provide a standard which um, an organization could write a specification to produce a course that would teach people these skills within the context of that particular organization or that particular person, which is another important aspect. Um, that particular um, national occupational standard is also part of the level three NVQ in um, archaeological practice. And that is the element of the uh, course handbook that has distilled part of that to be able to classify and compile data into specific criteria that you can assess to see if somebody can actually do that. And that's how NVQs work. It's how vocational training works everywhere else. And the way that, um, uh, the other way that in which it works is that you, you pass or fail, which is another important element of making vocational training work. You don't grade people in work-based learning because you never have a cohort that's big enough to develop, a, a, they call it a normal distribution. So you need to figure out what the thing is that you need to be able to do and whether you can do it or not. Um, right, the other thing that training does, which is really the, the main reason to do it, is that it provides people with motivation. And if we develop our training in a way that is sufficiently forward thinking and is actually designed to serve individual people and their individual needs within their careers and to help them to design the careers for themselves that they want to pursue, you then have a, a situation in which that person feels much more valued and feels much more themselves than simply a cog in the corporate machine. And often we discuss the, uh, the age old problem of what we get paid. <coughs> and we do it all the time. And the interesting thing about this is that salaries and working conditions are not motivators. What they do is they, they don't, the opposite of dissatisfaction is not satisfaction, it's not being dissatisfied. So if your pay is enough, your pay is enough. It still doesn't mean that you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> Whereas these things on the left, the satisfaction factors, do. And essentially, those are why we do this ridiculous job because it gives us those things. It certainly doesn't give us an awful lot of the stuff on the other side a lot of the time. And that's what we need to grasp. You know, these ideas are ideas from outside archaeology. Every tool that we use in archaeology is one that we've stolen from somewhere else and perverted to our own ends. So what we need to do is start looking at this kind of stuff because it's ideal for us because we are all fairly robust individualists and we need to find the things that make us tick and follow those dreams not necessarily to become the chap in the hat or a different chap in the hat which is everybody's idea of what an archaeologist should be and if we follow these things then we get to another um, lovely management buzzword which is the hierarchy of needs and and what tr good training leads to is this. And what good um, career structures lead to is that. 
And the self-actualization bit at the top of the pyramid is why people who are working in, um, in central government or in high levels in, in big jobs, that's why they genuinely don't understand what the problem is. Because as far as they're concerned, everything's fine. Because everything's fine for them. They can't see what it's like, yeah, don't worry, <laughs> being anywhere further down the pyramid. And what we need to do, I think, as a profession, is to ensure that all of our people, with all of their anxieties and issues and dreams and abilities, are heading to the top of that pyramid as much of the time as possible. Because that way, we'll get better stuff and we'll continue to create better archaeology. And we'll also, if we respect ourselves, we will gain the respect of those that we work with. And I think that, for me, is the, is the challenge of the next few years, is for everybody to find out what it is that makes themselves tick, find something that they want to do within that um, overarching set of standards and find a way of being able to do it and being able to prove that you can do it and do that within our organization so that it's a constant process of improvement and learning and finally I'm going to leave you with one of my favorites um, often attributed to Goethe but it's not his at all it's this chap the Scotsman and that is what we need to do you can't stop yakking about what how awful things are and get on with making them better. Thank you. <laughs>